right, so here we are. We are with the one and only Mr. Dr. Dave Smith, David E. Smith, founder of the Hate Ashbury Street Organization. I'm sorry, the Hate Ashbury Free Clinic, excuse me, folks. Um, and I'm in his office, and uh, we're here to find out what's going on with the with the with the with, with the clinic because I walk by it to go to the post office all the time, and not sure what's going on there. Well, the Haight Ashbury Free Clinic merged, uh, whose original motto was healthcare is a right, not a privilege, has merged with Walden House, and it is now uh, part of HR 360, which is the largest nonprofit treatment organization, which is located over in the Mission, and its primary focus is the people coming out of the criminal justice system, they have health and institution groups for people that have addiction and gone to jail and are coming out, and the homeless. The original site at 558 Clayton Street, which is a historic site, uh, they have <coughs> now a needle exchange. Yeah, I see that. So individuals come in, get a clean needle so they don't get infections and HIV and all that. And then they get they get on uh, bu uh, buprenorphine, which is the new medication that is being used for the treatment of addiction. And then some of them get involved in the psychosocial rehab, and then they go over to Walden House, and then some of them come out the other end in recovery. But the initial part of it is harm reduction. That, you know, we're in we've had this huge increase in overdose deaths here in uh, San Francisco. Yeah, that's how the fentanyl epidemic, I'm, and one of my questions to you was, would you be open to, I'm, we're just winging it here, because, you know, this is, this is the hate ash rate. <laughs> the, would you be open to, to kids, if they get drugs, they can have it tested to see if it has fentanyl in it, or something like that? Somebody asked me that question, because a lot of these kids didn't realize they were taking fentanyl. Do you, is, do you hear this? Well, that's a... a, a, a complex question because it, it originally th that's what the Hate ashbury Clinic did, bef you know, when addiction was a crime, the feds circled the area and you could do pretty much whatever you wanted in the hate, so we tested the drugs and analyzed and that was before fentanyl, but we had that capability. Yeah. And then <laughs> they wouldn't allow that to happen, but now you're starting to see a comeback with the fentanyl strips and uh, I know that the if you go into 558 Clayton Street with Mary Howe, the Homeless Youth Alliance, they have all the, <laughs> the drugs that they brought in on the wall. <clears throat> and it turns out that uh, uh, many of them are contaminated with fentanyl. You'd think you're taking methamphetamine, but it's methamphetamine and fentanyl. Even the marijuana has fentanyl in it. What? Yeah. And so uh, that contributes a lot to the adverse reactions you know that I uh, mean this year it's what are we end of March I mean there's been like that like maybe eight to ten people that are on the street you know the people that I have known you know stumbles and I mean God bless all these you know and I'm not blaming just fentanyl but it's also alcohol right. you know there's a lot of alcohol out yeah, there during COVID with the isolation and the difficulty getting to your recovery groups there's been a huge increase in alcohol and drug overdoses, methamphetamine, and it's somewhere the city's in a, a, a nationwide or a, a citywide crisis. The worst, though, is in the Tenderloin. Yeah. It's uh, bad here, but it's much worse in the Tenderloin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the condition of Hate Street now, since the COVID and all these shops that have closed, I mean, we've still got Amoeba Records, we've still got, you know, Sunny, you know, Love and Hate, we have, you know, a few and sundry places, but how do you feel about these places and the you know closed window shops and thank god for the sf heritage who is taking care of the corner right right there and a, another couple shops down so that's great we're going to have art and you know history still there but i mean did you see stuff like i mean you did you lived through the whole early 70s when it, everything got really ugly right i mean yeah. you were there was it very similar to this where things were it's worse now it's worse now yeah it's very sad because uh <sighs> As I shared with you, I'm working on my autobiography, Healthcare is a Right, Not a Privilege, and I walk down there, and I have memories of the Grateful Dead and of the, uh, playing on the flat red truck and developing their music on the panhandle, and, and uh, that was the era of the Hate Ashbury Free Clinic started mm -hmm. and it was just vibrant it was crazy but it was vibrant with art and culture and new psychedelic sounds and everything and 
Well, I mean, and uh, rest in peace, Brian Rohan, as I oh. mentioned earlier. He was he and Stepanian were helping all those kids that oh, were yeah. getting arrested and oh, all yeah. of that. I have memories of them with Halo. They, they, they busted so many kids that then they the lawyers, uh, uh, Stepanian and Rohan, decided to defend them through Halo, the Hate Ashbury Legal Organization, mm -hmm. and they said we're going to try every case and. Uh, they said, well, that'll just jam up the court. They arrested so many people then. Yeah. And it just the war on drugs just was, a, you know, uh, in this area, was a total failure. Yeah. And so they're the ones that developed, uh, Brian, you know, turned the coin dope law. They really started the legal defense for addicts wrongly uh, defended. And then it's, it was interesting because there's these narratives now where, all these interviews are coming out. That's why I like your project. You know, history is adding some light on what happened. And they had this interview with John Ehrlichman from Nixon in the 60s. Uh -huh. And they said that we can't arrest hippies for anti-war and we can't arrest blacks for being black. So we're going to equate hippies with marijuana and we're going to equate black with heroin and we're going to use the drugs to crack down. In other words, there was a political motive behind the police police surges and it was dangerous. I know that they had a big surge in 68, siege, big siege in 68. They were actually beating up kids on the street and they actually came into our detox program. I mean, what what police force goes into a treatment program? Wow. And I remember we came out, and uh, yeah, what said, was your reaction? Were you, well, you yelling? Can't, what you did can't you do? do that. You know, we were kind of out on the street fixing up bloody kids, and I got whacked on the butt, and ah. it was in the Chronicle, and I mean, it was uh, that was '68 when basically things were the worst. Yeah. And then the drug epidemic really hit, and the hate Ashbury uh, was devastated. And there was a lot of, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if it was worse then or now. I probably think it was probably worse then. I feel like the um, police... Uh, presence on Haight Street. I don't know if you knew Lily, the relief. Right. Hi, Lily, we love you. You know, but th in 2017, maybe because it was the summer of love anniversary, but it seemed like there were cops like on every block. And now, I mean, with COVID different, but I just feel like there's not nearly as much presence, and I don't know if that's good or bad. You know, they're not beating the kids off the street like they were as much. No. So no. now they're conglomerating more on the corner there on Haight and Ashbury. Is that okay? I mean, what do how do you feel about kids, you know, hanging out with their dogs? It, not even the COVID, just just hanging out. I mean, some of them have to sleep in tents on the Hate Ashbury or in the area, but I mean, that area can get very clustery. Right. Is that okay? What do we do? If it's happy or? Well, those are social policy issues yeah. to reflect on yeah. because it's not a healthy lifestyle. I hate to see that that uh, unhealthy lifestyle. Drinking, getting uh, drunk, and, yeah, and yeah. Uh, I know that we're big dog people, as you can tell. And I know my wife buys dog food and goes down there in that <laughs> corner, on that corner down there where they all congregate yeah. with the dogs and yeah. the people on the street. You know, thank us. But one of the things I found out, when, uh, you know, in 558 dealing with the homeless, which is is called uh, sympathetic engagement, and mm -hmm. says that people from the clinic and some people in the hay treat them like human beings. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, I yeah. like I said, I don't just step over them. I, right. I'm like, hey, I didn't stumble. I know their names. And, yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so that's wonderful. But I also, uh, as a physician, I think it's a public health hazard to not have toilets and stuff for the street. And I think also uh, hurts. Um, the businesses. The merchants, yeah. Now, like for us, we're just used to it, you know. I'm yeah. going, hi, how you doing? And getting some dog food. <laughs> and, but and the tourists come in that patronize the businesses, it freaks them out. Yeah. And of course, Sonny would be a better one to talk about that. You know, the online business, I'm very happy to hear. And Sonny is a real community leader. Yeah. And she is. She and I have talked a lot about. Uh, 
going to happen with the hate. If it's people like her and uh, Kristen at Booksmith, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that and I, me, I've lived on hate on Frederick Street for sixty years. I mean, there's a, some old stalwarts. Michael Xavier, the Hate Street right. Fair, Hate Ashbury Street Fair. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a, a there's a culture yeah. and a vibrancy there, and you transmit it to the next generation. So I hope what will happen is that will continue on, and things will come back. But that's a hope. I know. Well, that's one of my questions. Is you know, my magazine is trying to help. Hyper local with a global perspective about people right. taking care of their own communities no right. matter where they I are. I love it. I love it. I read your stuff and I think it's a great idea. Thanks, babe. Thank you, Dr. Dave. I'm honored. Um, but you know, I can't keep doing this. Is the f this the print stopped during COVID? But I'm really aiming to get uh, a summer edition. So do it four times a year and probably have a story about the what's going on in the corner of that building, the the Dula Morrison building, what that's going to become for real. The people, the merchants that are going to move into those two shops next door that used to be Peggy, um, the T-shirt shop that was there for 48 years, that one right on the corner. Yeah, and you know Peggy Concerta. Is yeah, I've interviewed. I've already interviewed. She's a historic her. figure here. Oh, huge with yeah. Nasidica. Yeah, I mean, and she even says a shout out to Dr. Dave and the you know Haight Ashbury Free Clinic, and she says we had food. I forget the name of the shop. We had. Police, not police protection, but it was. Uh, we just had safety. We had health care mm -hmm. um, and clothes. Her, right. <laughs> <laughs> and of course music. But how you know? I can't keep doing this for nothing. I mean, I have to go out and sell my ads, you know. But who are people in the neighborhood that? How can we help? How can I help keep the spirit and health and community, the spirit and health of the community alive? You know, what are the allies? Like you said, I guess Hank and uh, Kristen at the Hate Ashbury Neighborhood Council. Sonny at Sonny. Love and Hate. Yeah. SF Heritage. SF Heritage, yeah. yeah. And I, I think that uh, preservation of, uh, of the culture and the Stories history. Stories and the history. And even today, which is what I, why I started out, what, you know, how you feel about today. And you're writing a book about your famous quote. Um, healthcare is a right, not a privilege. So when that's out, I'll give you a little <laughs> shout, <laughs> out. shout out okay. on the Facebook and the uh, magazine. In fact, maybe we can do a little, when, when is it coming out? I'm almost done with it, and I'm going to try to have it ready by, we're having a, 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 a 54th anniversary of the Hate ashbury Free Clinic on the 6th and of April. Of June. Okay. Yeah, anniversary of the clinic, and okay. Sunny oh, is right. the chair got some of the old bands together because our clinic was built on rock and roll yeah. we were too radical for traditional funding so there's going to be this celebration as Bill Graham did with you all those exactly years yeah. yeah and then uh, I'll have a uh, friends and family version and then go to the publisher and then they'll mess with it and yeah. that probably the, 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 the version available for general public will be more like a year okay what I'm gonna do is have a poster and like a commemorative edition for donations to HR 36 that's a stage of my life that I'm in now I'm gonna train the next generation yeah. help with the community uh, try to keep things going I think it, what's amazing to me is how much interest there is in this area I get these re these interview requests from around the world yeah. people are very interested in this culture now are yeah, you one of the first free clinics in the country yeah the, the, yeah. Uh, the free the, the the concept of free came from the diggers yeah the, the free city yeah, the free and store the free, free, free store food. and this that and yeah. the other thing and then uh, but they wanted to have medical and all they had was they wanted to have barefoot doctors and I said no that isn't going to work doctors won't do that they want a building and they want malpractice insurance so the Haight Ashbury Free Clinic was the f first of the nationwide free clinic movement and I'm honored to be known as the father of the free clinic movement I mean, it's amazing how much stuff started in this little area at that time the nationwide free clinic movement addiction medicine addiction as a disease and has a right to treatment uh, 
The thing is, my question, that kind of leads to the next question, which is, you know, rock and roll is always a search. I could let you down, girl. Come on, boss. Come on. Yeah. Cute little dog. Been taking care of me while we talked to Dr. Dave. Kind of looks like Dr. Dave, the other <laughs> dog. <laughs> but, I mean, let's face it. Rock and roll is all about, you know, drugs, you know, hallucinogens and all of that. I mean, psychedelics being legalized. How do you feel? Let's talk about that a little bit. Are you excited about how psychedelics can help treat people medicinally? Uh, yeah, we're into the third psychedelic revolution, and I'm uh, that's kind of the last last part of my research is, or my life now is I still am uh, partially retired and I still treat addiction but uh, my kind of research uh, late, late stage areas are with psychedelic psilocybin and we're learning why psilocybin works there's an, an, uh, an area in the brain called the default mode interneural network and that's way down in the primitive area of the brain, a little band of neurons. And it's the, uh, the neurobiology of ego. And then when you, you, wow. you use the, psych, the, 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 the psychedelics like, like uh, psilocybin, it reduces activity in this default mode. That's what helps produce the dissolution of ego and the spirituality, and so there, there, there's this a, a part of a paper called the neurobiology of spirituality, and a lot of it comes out of an understanding of spirituality and recovery from addiction. So they've looked at, at why uh, LSD and psilocybin helps people recover from addictive disease. I mean, it doesn't make and sense. And marijuana has that clumped in there too, or no? Well, marijuana is a, 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 a psychedelic, but it's really, uh, uh, studies with psychedelic, with uh, marijuana are more the CBD for pain. Right. What this is, uh, is you don't take it er every day, so it's not like it suppresses what, what you do with mm -hmm. like LSD or, and psilocybin, much less potent. You take one to three dosages at high dosages. You don't take a little bit, you take a lot. That's what seems to produce this mystical, spiritual experience. And then it's transformative. It's like the bottom of AA. Bill Wilson, co-founder of AA, said that his bottom and how we became involved in the spiritual program of AA is uh, in the middle of DT's, uh, well, you know, he was hallucinating, and it wow. comes out of it. That was his bottom, yeah. and so yeah. it appears. I, I I have a whole lecture on uh, psychedelics in uh, the treatment of substance use disorders, and every one of the studies, uh, LSD, psilocybin, uh, ibogaine, ayahuasca, what it works is this high dose mystical experience that's what makes it work yeah. and the high dose mystical experience dampens tone in that default mode network and then it also looks at that the high dosage helps rewire that area of the brain that's why they're so long lasting you know uh, I I was very, I was a laboratory scientist, and I was a local drug expert, and then this whole thing developed, and I lived right over here on, you know, two blocks from here on Frederick yeah. Street, and yeah. this whole thing was happening, and I went to Side of the Hill, and I saw all these people doing this, and I said, hmm, I'm doing this, sticking this in my lab animals up at UC, why don't I try it myself? And I did, and I had a, a high dose mystical transformative experience, and that's what made me take the risk to start a free clinic because wow. at that time well wow. you know when i started a clinic or yeah. to get my malpractice insurance canceled i was at risk for for uh, arrest i mean it was so out of character for me in fact uh, uh, so are you saying you were a square dr dick i was a square <laughs> i'm a, my grandparents were farm workers 
Yeah, from I was Oklahoma. reading about that yeah. from Oklahoma. Yeah, and you grew up in Bakersfield. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. your parents died when you were young. And died that's when I was young, and I was driven for financial and professional success, and I would be the last one that you would think that would do something like this. Yeah. So I just got involved in the psychedelic culture, and I had a transformative experience, and I took all this risk except it just seemed like the thing to do yeah. and well having survived a parent my mom died when I was young but I'm sure that I would imagine that the psychedelic trip for you helped you heal that in some oh, way yeah. Yeah, am I projecting that or is that true no it's totally accurate what yeah. they're doing now is finding that psychedelics help deal with traumatic experiences yeah helps ch uh, the trauma is in encoded and trapped in an area of the brain called the cingulate gyrus and it just keeps going around and around and around and it's subconscious until something triggers a memory of it and what the psychedelics d do is uh, like they have these ayahuasca rituals for the shaman mm -hmm. and I know that there's some vets that have done it mm -hmm. and up to consciousness comes the memories of uh, you know, the friends being blown up, and then it can process it. Now to get, if it gets trapped, it doesn't get processed in the areas of the brain. Right. You don't grieve it. You don't deal with it in the healthy way the brain right. deals with it. Doesn't it with alcohol or yeah. Yeah. That's what. That's that's I <coughs> why the um, the area that I'm working on is is recovering people because I'm very involved in AA recovering people. Yeah that have trauma, so they, 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 they stop drinking and using, mm -hmm. and a uh, significant part of their life is going okay, but the trauma memories persist. And yeah, it's the, the elephant in the room still, oh, right? It just happens, to, doesn't, it happens not to be drunk anymore, right? <laughs> so they have, they have these spiritual awakening groups, which well. they combine uh, psilocybin and AA which seems very controversial yeah yeah it's a new world yeah. and that's the area that I'm I'm looking at the people that I'm working with including me uh, it is a sp spiritual awakening to deal with individuals that are in AA interested in spirituality have residual trauma memories that impact on their lives and see if, because remember Bill Wilson, co-founder of AA, took LSD and had a, uh, for depression, and had a real spiritual experience. I and didn't know go, that. Yeah. I didn't know that. And he went to the big board of AA and said, this is something, but they didn't want to have anything to do with drug-induced spiritual experience. Right. And then it all went south with uh, you know, when Timothy Thierry Larry got into his whole scene, and yeah. not, not that it wasn't interesting stuff, but what it did was compromise the legitimate studies. Well, now there's all these controlled studies. This is what I'm telling you now is not opinion. Right. This is science based research where they have a hypothesis. Yep. They have a population, yep. and the key to this population is the traditional stuff hasn't worked. And then it starts making sense out of a lot of what happened in the, in the 60s, except they didn't. It, it makes sense out of psychedelic music and the good stuff, but it also kind of makes sense out of the bad stuff. I mean, right. This is, this is powerful stuff. You don't mess with your brain in a uncontrolled setting. Right, so it's always under controlled setting, so yep. if the person starts to have some sort of freak out or whatever, then there's a there's a person to sort of talk them off the cliff or whatever? Is yeah. that, okay. I mean, I'm very interested in it all, too, and I've, I've had this conversation with Sonny, and it was in the first edition, I believe, but uh, how, like I said earlier, and alcohol really is far more a problem on hate street than psychedelics. Oh, yeah. I mean, psychedelics really aren't uh, you know, the methamphetamine
amphetamine, I'm sure. That, by the way, is what I have on my wall, that air beer you did with Sunny. Yeah. I had the picture of yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah, that was the, I think that was the first edition. No, that was cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, of course, this is Jerry walking down. Did, did, did you ever work on Jerry? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, that was the yeah. first one. Walking down Haight Street, 1968, March 3rd. Before it got bad, I guess, huh? <laughs> yeah, there was that period of time. See, that's the, that's the memories. Of, oh, uh, yeah. That's what it looked like, huh? <laughs> I mean, the fun was still there, right? It was still there. And the guy who took that picture is this guy, Steve Brown. See your friends? Who was a Vietnam vet, or a Vietnam, in Vietnam during the Summer of Love and was bringing Jimi Hendrix music to the ships overseas. Isn't that beautiful? And yes, he did bring a little bit of acid too and brought it to the ships. <laughs> hey, listen, he said it hell, it helped. <laughs> so, I'm going to keep looking at my notes here. Uh, thank you for believing in my magazine. That, that means a lot. That yeah. means so much to me. Um, and Rohan, people such as you two. Um, let me keep yeah. one of these so I can reference it for the book. Okay. Um, let me. Let's finish this. Okay. Which one yeah. do you want to keep? But yeah. Let me. Uh, you can have whichever one you want. We'll figure out which is the best. Okay. One. Yeah. So I guess the final words. Like again, the backlight's getting bad, so I keep moving around. But who cares? Um, it's all about the conversation rather than there's Jerry. Oh, yeah, there. yeah, our rock medicine and that we were known as the Kaiser Deadhead, and he did a, all the medical, and I was involved in a couple of his treatments and uh, the fairies. You know, that's when the drug scene went bad. It really hammered the dead. Yeah. Not that one wasn't. That was when it was cool. There is Ram Das. Yeah, and there's Mountain Girl up there, way up there. Kim Cheesy. Oh yeah! Wow. Yeah. Ah. Aww. And now are you involved with maps? I'm sure you must be. Oh yeah. Yeah. We had an annual conference. Uh, Rick Goblin uh, chaired it. We have a theme issue of our journal. Psychedelic research, and that's a lot of the studies that I've been quoting to you. Yeah. In fact, uh, um, Michael Pollan said when the th when the history of the third psychedelic revolution is written, Michael Pollan will be the leader of getting it started with maps. Wow. Yeah. Well, I should probably inter do an interview with them as well. That's David Wills, that one there at the Hate Ashbury. I just interviewed him last week. Well, I love that history. He said, oh, it's wonderful. And he said that they, they, they were, he was told that the water was going to rise, and that's why he's in the boat in the foreground. <laughs> there was a theory in one year, I guess it was somewhere in the 70s, that, yeah, they said that the elevation of the water was going to go up, and we're going to need boats. But, I mean, it might have been that. might have been the psychedelics. <laughs> so what would you like to say to the good people of the hate, the hyper-local hate street voice? with a global perspective. What would you like to say to the communities of the world, yeah. to our beautiful community yeah. here? Uh, pr preserve our history and culture. Remember all the great things that came out of it. But learn from the mistakes. There was a lot of mistakes made, and uh, particularly the hard drugs. So preserve the good, beware the bad, and but uh, I, I want the hate to come back very badly. Yeah. It is such a special place. And I want, the, uh, you know, uh, historians you know, like yourself and uh, cultural institutions like Love on Hate and the Booksmith mm -hmm. to be preserved in Amoeba Records. Amoeba yeah. Records. And, uh, you know, right up the hill, you see Med Center where I'm on the Faculty, some of the it's best. Where you went to school, right? Where I went yeah. to school. Some of the best research is going on on the, all these neuro, uh, neurological issues. They have uh, psilocybin trials. They're going to have a 
they're going to legalize psilocybin counseling centers. In fact, if that li evolves and live long enough, my book comes out, that space down below, I'm going to have a, a uh, psychedelic bookstore. Whoa. Yeah. And I'll have you there with your your history. Yeah, absolutely. We're That's gonna have, cool. We're going to have a podcast. And, and you can sit around and read these cool books. And right. That's great. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. I had a thought when you were, we were giving an, a, a, an homage to all the places that are supporting. You know, what, and this, you know, I don't know if this is the right question to ask, but what about places like Zam Zam, which is an old institutional, you know, it's one of the oldest bars on Haight Street. I mean, yeah. You can't close down the bars if we're worried about alcohol, right? That's just yeah. an issue with alcohol. Yeah. I just want to clarify that it's not that it's anti-alcohol, it's more, no. an, it's anti, because I think that's a very important distinction oh, yeah. to make, because a lot of people think, oh, I will I have a few glasses of wine on the weekends, and am I a bad person? And I think that's a, that's a very... Yeah, well, that's a misunderstanding of alcoholism as a brain disease. You can take... A lifetime of alcohol. You can have a, a couple of glasses of wine every night for the rest of your life. And then you can take an individual that's alcoholic and he'll drink a whole bunch at once and then he will detox and stay sober for a while and then have another bender and then detox and the end of the lifetime the social drinker that drinks a couple glasses of wine uh, will have drank as much as the alcoholic, but the, the alcoholism is what's bad for the brain. So it's not the drug. It's not even the amount that you drink. Huh. It's how your body reacts to it. It's called a brain stress hypothesis. So in AA, uh, what I always say, uh, we are not carrying Asian. We're not trying to rid 